Hello and welcome to Badger Talks Live, which brings exciting happenings, resources, and talent from your UW flagship campus to the people of Wisconsin and beyond. I'm John Lund, and I'm originally from Waukesha, Wisconsin. I'm a senior mechanical engineering student here at the UW College of Engineering, and I'm a part of the Mechanical Engineering Senior Design Program. It is my pleasure today to introduce the program coordinator from the Mechanical Engineering Senior Design Program, Michael Cheadle. Today, he will be giving an overview of the program and introducing members of my student design team, the Blue Green Busters, who will share their work on developing a mechanical device to remove harmful algae from Wisconsin waterways. Mike received his bachelor's degree in physics from Western Illinois University and his MS and PhD in mechanical engineering from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. His research interests include chirogenics, superconducting power transmission, energy systems, and hybrid solar lighting. As coordinator of the senior design program, Mike oversees senior level engineering students who work in teams on a two semester design project where they solve a real world problem. By actively engaging in this design experience, students learn how to apply a structured design process that fosters innovative solutions, how to analyze complex problems using knowledge gained in previous coursework, and how to build a solution using state of the art manufacturing techniques. Please welcome Mike Cheadle. Thanks, John, for that introduction. Uh, as John mentioned, my name's Michael Cheadle. I'm a senior lecturer here in the mechanical engineering department. Uh, and I'm also a coordinator for the senior design program, which is a program that takes students like you see here, James, Thomas, Michael, John, and Taylor, uh, hooks them up with clients. Uh, they can be all sorts of different clients. I'll talk a little bit about that um, and uh, gets them to work on projects over the course of two semesters. So their senior year when they've sort of gained all this knowledge over the past three, four years um, from their co-ops and the classes here, they can then apply that to a, a real world problem. Um, and so what you see today is sort of, that's the, the problem they're working on, right? Engineering behind blue-green algae removal from the Fox River. Um, so this is a common problem in Wisconsin. If you've not heard about it, they'll describe a little bit more to you what the problem is. But the basic idea is that there's some blue-green algae in the river uh, and waterways and uh, they wanna to try to find mechanical ways to get that out of the, the system, right? Out of the rivers, out of the lakes. And so you can kind of see that summarized here with this image at the top, which is a boat on the top right-hand side and a little torpedo looking thing on the left-hand side, which is basically a net, which is uh, sort of the idea is you drag this net through, you capture some of the mechanic, or so mechanically capture some of the blue-green algae. Um, and what they're doing in particular with this image is they're looking at the CFD is what we call it. So the computational fluid dynamics. So how the flow comes in from the right-hand side, goes around the boat and then goes through that, that net and looking at uh, things like drag on that net to see you know, if we're gonna put energy into this, how much energy do we have to put in to actually move this net through the water? So they'll go through that in a lot more detail um, and a lot of sort of why they chose that design. Uh, but that's uh, sort of the idea here is, uh, um, you know, them working with this client to try to figure out uh, how to solve this problem. So on the next slide, I wanted to sort of give you an overview of sort of what our program does in general. And I'm going to specifically talk about this group. But um, the idea here is we have student teams, in this case, the Blue Green Busters. Uh, we have a client. Uh, in this case, this is Brown County, Wisconsin. So this is Jeff Flint, the Brown County Deputy Executive, Mike Mashinsky, the Brown County Conservationist. Uh, they approach us, approached us through the University Alliance. We'll talk about that in a little bit too, but uh, they needed this. So they wanted to understand sort of the mechanical uh, ways of capturing algae, specifically in the Fox River. So my job here as coordinator was to sort of meet these, get these two things matched up, right? So get a team uh, and that client matched up. Uh, and then what the program does is it actually uh, gives us gives the students resources. So we we're very free in terms of giving the students ownership of their projects. We really want them to take ownership and engage with this. We don't really want it to feel like a class, even though it is a class. We want them to engage with the uh, the the project, the client, um, and what we try to do is just give them resources. And one of the main resources we give them uh, are are really great professors that we have in the mechanical engineering department. And in this case, that that faculty consultant is uh, Alejo. So Professor Roldan Azate is a professor here. In the mechanical engineering department, he's uh, really good with fluid mechanics, which is a, a you know sort of the center part of this problem. Uh, he's also the director of the UW Cardiovascular Fluid Dynamics Laboratory, um, and so he does uh, some much larger things than than this, right? He, he's looking at a lot of uh, things, but his again his specialty here is fluid mechanics for this particular project. So that's why we were, we're matched up here. He's been a really great advisor for the team. I think if you went and talked to the team, they'd tell you how much they love him and how much fun it was to work with him. He's he's a really fantastic professor. But that's the general idea of what we do here. 
is trying to figure out, uh, you know, how to get these teams working together, giving them the support they need to actually get through uh, the, the project. So on the next slide is sort of some of the other stuff that we give them. Uh, this being mainly a design process, right? So this is a design class. It's very different than other classes that they'll have experienced. Uh, so it, typically in another class, right, you sit through a lecture, you get a homework assignment, that homework assignment have a right answer. So the problems are really well formed. Um, this is not that at all, right? And they'll certainly tell you that. I think when they start these projects, uh, this group will tell you too that uh, it is uh, a bit stressful in the beginning because you sort of, you don't really know what you're doing and you're just thrown into this deep end trying to figure out what all the, what the problem is. And so we try to give them a design process to help them through that. And the first part of that design process is empathy. So it's actually going out to Brown County, uh, Mike and Jeff at Brown County, that's the human centered nature of this, right? They're actually working with hu other human beings to try to understand their problem. So they, they're trying to empathize, they're trying to figure out, ask them questions, sort of like your five-year-old sort of bugging them saying, why, 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 why? They really wanna to get to the, that, the details of and understand the problem so that in the end, what they wanna be able to do is make decisions on behalf of their clients um, and uh, do something that their client couldn't otherwise do. And in this case, this is something mechanical, right? So when you, when you engage with that client, the client is not necessarily a mechanical engineer or good at putting an object together, physical object together, but that's what our students are good at. So they're taking that empathy defining the problem, understanding it, and then getting it to some sort of physical uh, realized solution, right? So eventually uh, what they get to is a point where they can ideate, right? So they can get to this point where they can look at lots of different solutions. They get to that creative side of their brain where they're thinking about, well, what could I, what, what's one way to solve this problem? What's another way? And they don't, they're not critical at all, but they're trying to just figure out what's the coolest way things we could do. And then that's sort of the, the, the divergent process of this uh, design process or the divergent part of this design process. And then once they've had that generation, they can go and they can use their critical side of their brain. They can begin to prototype and test. They can begin to use all of those things, take little pieces from here or there and put them all together and hopefully come up with something that's innovative or new um, and certainly something that solves their client's problem. Right? That's what we want them to do. Um, this presents lots of challenges for the students, as you can imagine, right? So it's that idea of going from abstract to concrete, like I mentioned, this can be really sort of tenuous in the beginning for students. They get used to it um, after a while and so they understand it, but it can be challenging at the start. There are lots of resources that we give them, and not in terms of faculty consultants, but other things as well, right? So they work with the makerspace and the team lab to prototype. Uh, we give them a TA to engage with. They'll see what other teams are doing. They have a design studio here as well. So there's lots of different things, that, resources that they need to manage. Um, and just the project and management and teamwork in general is something that uh, is certainly a, a challenge for them, um, as well as, you know, actually putting their hands on stuff and taking that abstract idea and actually making something physical, putting their hands together, you know, on metal and wood and, and figuring those things out. Um, and ultimately, you know, communicating what they've done, which is what is really great about today is they're going to get a chance to sort of share with you what they've done. Um, that's also a struggle for them, but it's a lot of fun. We always hammer this. A, they've given lots of presentations, as they'll tell you, um, and we want them to get out and be comfortable doing that. And, you know, if you can't communicate your work, you know, you might not have even done it. Right. So uh, some of the things that they struggle with, but some of the resources that we give them as well. So on the next slide, I just want to give you a, a quick idea of sort of some of the other projects we work on. I'm not going to spend too much time here. You're welcome to uh, sort of look us up. Um, but uh, we do competitions. So Whisk Wind is a competition project we work on. We work with industry. Uh, we work with research. So professors who come to us and say we want to do something um, and we'll sort of hook design teams up with those professors. And we do a lot of cross-disciplinary stuff. So we work with Lennon Rogers, uh, who's a previous presenter here at Badger Talks Live. Um, we work with him in the makerspace uh, and students in the biomechan biomedical engineering department as well as electrical to work on projects together. Overall, we do 50 projects a year. Uh, which is a lot. So we, we cover a lot of territory. We have a lot of uh, great students. Um, and on the next slide, I'll show you sort of where we get uh, this project. This project came from Gavin Luter at the uh, University Alliance. He's the managing director there. So pre-COVID days, I went and actually sat down and had coffee with him. Uh, and we talked about sort of what uh, the possibilities were here, uh, what his program does, which is really great. It goes out and sort of understands what we're doing here and the UW community and then connects that to the governments uh, outside of here, right? And so that's how we got connected with Brown County is because Gavin brought that to us. Um, and so we ended up having conversations uh, back in, I think, January with Jeff and Mike and sort of determined, you know, what could we do together? Um, and they had this project with Blue Green Algae. So we sort of made that uh, work. Um, and that's sort of where I got involved. And that's where I got the team involved at the, in January. So the team's actually been working now from January 
um, all last semester, uh, and then uh, coming back this semester, they've been working on the project. They still got a little ways to go. They got about a month and a half to go or so. So they, you'll sort of see them in the uh, sort of final stages here, but not quite the final stages. Uh, but that leads us to the next slide, which is the team. Uh, so you've seen uh, their lovely faces here already. Uh, John, uh, James, Thomas, Taylor, and Michael, they have worked really hard on this project and they have, not, have done a lot of really great work. Uh, they're all actually graduating in December. And you can sort of see what they're going to do after graduation here is sort of a representative of what we do in mechanical engineering, which is prepare students really well for a, a broad range of careers, right? So from John thinking about quality engineering to James thinking about engineering and sustainability to Thomas's aeronautical stuff uh, to you know uh, Taylor's healthcare, um, and then Michael just seems like he's going to go out and have fun and then come back and work hard. Um, we do a lot to prepare students for that, where they have a lot of freedom and a lot of uh, possibilities in mechanical engineering. So it's, it's a lot of fun for the students. And like I said, they've done a really great job. I don't want to spend any more time here, so I would like to throw it back to John um, and uh, just make a comment that, you know, John and I have worked together before. He was a student in my thermodynamics class, a uh, really great student there, and it was fun to see him work on this project. Um, and without further ado, I'll pass it off to John and he'll give you an overview of sort of the rest of the presentation and the work that they've done. Yeah, thank you, Mike. Well, before we get any farther along, it's important that we go over some background of blue-green algae so we actually know what's going on. So what actually is blue-green algae and how does it actually affect humans and animals? Well, first off, blue-green algae is a cyanobacteria, which means it uses photosynthesis to grow. And where you generally find it is in these warmer bodies of water. So think of areas like bays, lakes, slow moving rivers, or even shallower bodies of water. For example, in Wisconsin, it's generally found in these warmer summer months from the late summer, think July, August through September, October, when the water temperatures reach their highest temperatures, along with they get the most UV light for this growth. And this bacteria and algae is on the size of micron. So it's a very, very small organism when we look at it on its fundamental basis. And what actually causes is an excess runoff of nutrients in the terms of phosphorus and nitrogen. So think of runoff from fertilizers that you use in your home, with industrial runoffs and farm fertilizers that feed into these bodies of water. But it does cause issues for humans and animals for the fact in high enough quantities, once it's decomposed and whatnot, it releases toxins in these harmful algae blooms. What it can do, for example, in fish is it can irritate their skin, gills, cause liver damage, even if in high enough concentrations cause death to them. When it comes to humans, on the other hand, what it can do is cause skin irritation, stomach issues, and even feel like flu symptoms if you're around high enough quantities. But now I wanna get into the actual area that we'll be working with and how it affects the whole community on here. So when we look at this image that's on the screen, we can see there's industrial farm runoff along with the fertilizers with the nitrogen and phosphorus, and it forms these toxic algae blooms. But we also have what causes dead zones. So when it blooms across the whole lake, it suffocates out oxygen from below the surface. So it kills things like plants, like I mentioned before, can kill fish. But on the other hand, it also offers poor water quality. People don't wanna go and recreate in these waters, go fishing, go swimming as it is toxic. And it distributes throughout the whole entire water column for the fact that it is so small, any currents will distribute it throughout. On the other hand too, people that live along these water lines have properties actually face decreased property values due to the lack of interest of wanting to be around this toxic algae. Now that leads me into where we're actually gonna be working out of. So we're gonna be working out of the lower Fox River in Brown County. The image on the right that you see, the black is just representing the water where the green on the image is actually blue green algae blooms during the summer months. So this area that we're working with is an approximately seven mile stretch it's about a quarter to half mile wide. So it is fairly wide area that we're be dealing with. But on the other hand, it is also reasonably shallow from just a handful of feet up to about 20 at its deepest spot. Well, why are we actually working on this portion of the Fox River? Well, first off, it feeds into the green, in the green bay, bay. So if any algae flows in it to the bay, what happens is it has this excess room to essentially spread and grow from the sunlight and expand. But this portion of the river is also densely populated with communities. So it does affect many communities along the way. But most importantly, it does have high concentrations of blue-green algae that can actually be worked with. Now, there are two possible paths to reduce this algae. There's a preventative path and a remediation path. On a preventative side of things, you can enact regulations, but this is, takes government legislation, which can take years to decades, along with actually seeing these regulations kick into effect and see the reduction of phosphorus and nitrogen leaching into the waterways. 
But on the other hand, there's also the remediation side that can be done. This is essentially where we come in with harvesting algae. But now, since we need to harvest algae, how are we actually going to do that? And this is where the net harvest, where the harvesting solution comes in. And I'd like to hand it off to James to speak a little bit more about our design process and also where we're going about it. Thanks, John. So when our team began to work on this project, we were quickly confronted with a vast range of questions and considerations that would need to be factored into our design. Blue green algae are incredibly small, and the Fox River is a large body of water. Our harvesting method would be contingent on a wide range of factors from the distribution of blue green algae in the river to the impacts on the river users and wildlife. As a small team of mechanical engineering students, we didn't have the expertise to fully consider all of these factors, nor did we have the time to become experts in wildlife biology or civil and environmental engineering. However, our combined knowledge as mechanical engineering students did put us in a great position to be able to analyze the mechanical elements of this process and help Brown County better understand how harvesting algae on the Fox River could actually work. On the next slide, we'll talk a bit about how we narrowed our design. We were also able to rely on the work that has been done by experts in other fields here at UW-Madison. The starting point for our research was a cost-benefit analysis of harvesting blue-green algae in Brown County, which was published recently by the La Follette School of Public Affairs. While this report was just a general overview of the economic costs and benefits of blue-green algae removal from the waterways of Brown County, it was written with the help of professors from the Civil and Environmental Engineering systems engineering, chemical and biological engineering, and lim limnology centers here at UW-Madison. The report gave a brief overview of a number of possible ways to extract blue-green algae from the Fox River, including chemical remediation, the raceway ponds that you see in the top right corner, and using boats with nets as you see pictured in the bottom right. They concluded that boats with nets were the most cost-effective way to harvest blue-green algae from a wild source. And since that was their conclusion, we decided to move forward with that as the most optimal way to uh, begin harvesting blue-green algae out of the Fox River. So on the next slide, we see how the team compiled a number of different net and boat-based extraction methods for blue-green algae. As you see on the top left corner, the plankton nets that you see there are typically used for harvesting microscopic organisms out of waterways, um, sampling for microscopic organisms, and being able to collect them at various depths and at any point in the width of the river was a real advantage to these plankton nets. There's the boom with net in the top right corner, which has a floating boom with a net suspended from it that allows uh, collection of a large amount of materials over a large surface area. The traveling screen in the bottom left corner has the advantage of being able to remove the sampled material and separate it out from the water, um, thus dewatering it while it's collecting the material. But it typically only works near the surface of the water and is not a very wide way of collecting any uh, sampling material. The blue-green algae vacuum in the bottom right is also able to dewater or remove the water from the harvested material, but it typically works near the shoreline. After constructing a decision matrix and comparing a number of these different methods, the team decided that the plankton net was our best extraction method to move forward with, since it could be used at various depths and various widths. From here, we went on to optimize this net, and I'll pass it along to my teammate, Tommy, who can talk a little bit more about how we went on to optimize those nets. Thanks, James. Like he discussed, the team decided to move forward with this plankton net extraction method. But you see, plankton nets are typically used in a vertical tow motion, sampling throughout the water column. But because how John discussed, the Fox River can get very shallow at points, this method wouldn't be very practical in our use. Instead, we're going to have to have a boat tow this net horizontally through lengths of the river. This means that along with our collection rate, we now have to consider fuel consumption in our optimization study. We have to transform our plankton net into a blue-green algae collection net, and we constructed an optimization study to do so. So our two main considerations here were how much algae we can collect with the net and how much fuel it takes to tow these nets through the water. But in order to actually measure these deliverables, we first had to quantify them, and we quantified them by using 
using uh, variables such as the open area ratio. The open area ratio, or OAR, is a variable commonly used in plankton net designs. And what it is, is the uh, ratio between the total area through which water can leave a net divided by the total area in which water can enter the net. In other words, it's the filtration area divided by the inlet area. This value can then be scaled by the net's porosity, which is a function of its mesh size or how big the little holes are. And this gives you the OAR. As you can see, this is a geometrically driven theoretical filtration efficiency. And it's a quick way to quickly derive the uh, theoretical efficiency of a net and compare it to other designs or previous prototypes. On the other hand, though, fuel consumption gets a bit more complicated to measure. See, our fuel consumption, we decided to measure the drag force of a net. Drag force is basically the resistance, or how hard it is to pull a object through a fluid and its resistance. The higher resistance, the higher the drag force, and the more fuel it would take to move said net through the water. And so in our optimization study, in order to collect as much algae as possible, we wanted to maximize our OAR. And then to minimize the fuel consumption required to move these nets, we needed to minimize the drag force. But how do we go about doing this? First, we had to set some variables and boundaries. Our variables are the factors that we are going to change about a net's design. In this case, in our studies, we realized that the mouth diameter of the net and its total net length have the largest impact on its resulting OAR. And these were the two variables that we moved forward with changing. The boundaries, as you can see here, were determined by setting a minimum allowable OAR of nine. An OAR of nine, uh, Anything below nine means that this net would be less efficient than needed for extraction of something as small as cyanobacteria from the water. We need to have an OAR that surpassed this value. And with that boundary set, we are able to uh, extrapolate that our net could be between two meters and four meters and have a diameter of 0.5 meters to 0.58 meters. It is also important to note that our drag force simulations use a CFD like Mike talked about, which is a computational fluid dynamics software. We used ANSYS Fluent to do this. And in order to get simulations that would run in less than 10 years, we had to make some assumptions. This assumption was that we could model our nets using a thin walled approximation. This means we're using a worst case scenario. We look at a net and we consider it to be fully clogged. It means that no water can pass through the walls of the net. Uh, this means that the water once entering the net can't escape and has resulting zero velocity as you see but also um, this allows us to look at how much drag, uh, the maximum amount of drag we can expect from a net design, which provides us with still very valuable information. And as you can see here, our optimization study successfully uh, determined our uh, optimized net design. You can see in the pressure profile there, the results of the study, we, our optimized net had a total diameter of 0.5 meters and a total length of four meters. And this uh, gave us an OAR of 12.9, and a resulting drag force of 205 newtons, about 205 newtons. This means that our optimized net was about 43% more efficient than our baseline OAR of nine. And also means that our resulting drag force of this net was less than 50 pounds of force. This is ex extremely uh, reasonable in a real world application and most motors on towboats would be able to handle this. It also implies that there is practicality in using more than one net at a single time during a tow. The more nets you have in the water, the more algae you can extract at a time. So this was extremely promising. But during this entire study, we started to think, okay, we have an optimized net, but where are we gonna put them? And so during the study, we also modeled a flat bottom typical tow boat. And we ran it at its typical tow speed of 1.5 meters per second. This uh, simulation showed us how the wake of a boat, and if you've ever ridden on a boat, you boat and look off the back, you've seen a wake. Uh, would interfere with the rate of algae entering the net. The turbulence and cavitation caused by the motor or wake of the boat would disrupt the distribution of blue-green algae through the water column and move it away from the mouth of the net, meaning that our collection rates would be lower if the net would be towed directly behind the boat as showed in that left picture. On the other hand, during the simulation, we can see that on the left hand and right hand side of the boat, the flow is much more straight, smooth, and laminar. This implies that if our nets, nets were to be towed off the wings of the boat there, we could expect to see a maximum collection rate. So what a success. We, during the simulation, we theoretically determined our optimized net design. We determined how big it should be, how long it should be. And we also identified locations of where we get the optimal collection rates. But again, these are simulations and somewhat theoretical. 
Therefore, we had to move into a more real world application. And now I will pass it over to my teammate Taylor to discuss how we can test these ideas in a real world prototype scenario. Thanks, Tommy. So I'll be talking about the prototyping stage, as Tommy said. So now that we have our plankton net design, we're moving forward into prototyping. So our prototype is the plankton net, as Tommy talked about, along with the testing um, equipment that we need for the test procedure. So why are we creating a prototype? What we need to do is find the drag force data at varying speeds. Um, and then we are using this data to minimize fuel consumption on a per net basis. So in order to do this, we want to minimize the drag force in order to minimize the fuel consumption. And this is, again, dependent on the net design, as Tommy talked about previously. Um, this is just one piece of the puzzle. So there are other factors that we could consider um, in designing, but this is what we are moving forward with. So here you see two po possible prototype test environments that we are looking into. The first one on the left side is a tank. In this scenario, the net is stationary and we are flowing water through the net in order to simulate a river. Here you see that there's a pump and the pump is pumping up water through the pipe and into the net and then we would be collecting drag force that way. In the second scenario, we are using a pool. So this is the Nick pool at UW-Madison. Um, this scenario is when the water is stationary and the net is being dragged through the water to find velocity that way. So in this scenario, the, um, there would be a cart alongside the pool and the net is being dragged across it and then drag force is measured that way. So for both of these test methods, we came up with some basic test assumptions. Um, so the first one is that river has zero flow relative speed of boat and river. Um, the net will travel perfectly horizontal in real world conditions so that we're not considering um, vertical motion for that. Um, net will scale perfectly to full scale size in real world application. The net maintains smooth flow around it, and for the, for the pool specifically, the cart is equivalent to a boat. So next, Michael will be talking about the specific um, test environment that we are moving forward with and the procedure. Thank you, Taylor. So actually moving into the physical prototyping phase of our design, we have four main uh, steps that we needed to take. We're currently in the first step, which is actually the build and test. So we are manufacturing our own prototypes or a scaled down model of the net that we optimize in Tommy's uh, analysis. And then also the test setup, which I will walk through in the next couple of slides. But after we have set up our prototype and actually collected our data, we'll move into analyze or analyzing our data into a force versus velocity graph. And it will be similar to what you see uh, for uh, the graph on the right hand side. This is an example of just four different uh, cars that have drag force at varying speeds from zero to 80 miles per hour. We will not be able to go up to 80 miles per hour for our test for our net, but even with uh, various speeds up to about six miles per hour, we can still see an initial trend in the drag force for uh, the data collection that we will, um, that we're prioritizing. And then once we have that for a scale model net, we'll move into correlating that up into our full size net to see what kind of drag force that we, have, we would see for that. And then we can relate that into cost and energy efficiency for um, a boat that would be actually be dragging the full size net. The actual test procedure that we are currently manufacturing and then we'll use to uh, drag the net along the pool is uh, this metal cart that you see on the right. Uh, we decided to go ahead with using the local UW-Madison recreational swimming pool rather than building our own tank with a pump due to the fact that we do have a limited budget and we have limited equipment that we could use to uh, for data collection. So instead, we are manufacturing our own uh, metal cart that we will have a lever mechanism as a metal arm, which is similar to what many people think of as a seesaw. So it's a little... Uh, pin at the center of the metal arm, and then you have a force gauge on one end, and then the net on the other. And so as the net feels some force while you're pushing the cart along the way, and uh, you have some speed, the force gauge will be able to read what kind of force that the net is experiencing. 
And then finally, we'll also have a high speed camera mounted to the cart so that we can determine what speed we are uh, pushing the net up in the water so we can correlate the force to specific speed. But as I mentioned, we would like to see the uh, trend between force and speed. So uh, we, we plan to take uh, data points for drag force at various speeds. And then we'll also need to conduct separate trials or numerous trials at each speed to ensure that our data is accurate and to remove any outliers that we might have from any human errors or uh, issues with our data collection process. But just a quick little animation that we've created in the bottom of the screen is the cart with the net being pushed along. It's a pretty simple test when you think about the basic steps you need to take. You just need to make sure the net is submerged uh, below the waterline and then push the cart parallel to the swimming lane. If you do not walk in a straight line or, or push the cart in a straight line, uh, there may be an issue with data collection since your force would not correlate perfectly to dragging the, the net in a perfectly straight line. And then finally, once you reach the end of the swimming lane, you stop your data collection, turn around and repeat or go back to restart and then repeat as well. But finally, for throughout this, the last two semesters, the project outcomes that we are working on and we're planning to deliver to our clients, uh, Brown County, are these three main steps. So as I mentioned, we will create our own prototype design and test procedure. And as we finish manufacturing our tests, our prototype, and then also complete our tests, we'll continue to optimize our design and we'll uh, make any refinements that we need to so that future individuals or groups or even Brown County themselves, if they would like to continue testing at different speeds or even different uh, net geometries, they can follow our, our guidelines and continue tests uh, with ease. And then also uh, we'll conduct our uh, drag force testing, which should be conducted in the next couple of weeks since we are still working on manufacturing our prototype. And after that's completed, as I mentioned, we will uh, then correlate that to a rough estimate for cost and energy consumption for actually towing one of these nets behind the boat. And that has to do with more um, relating drag force and the engine of specific boats and the RPMs, which is uh, some formulas that we are still figuring out, but that is definitely our final stage that we still need to reach after we collect data. So I wanna thank you all for letting us present on our uh, project that we've been working on for a year now. And I believe we still have time for questions. Great job, everybody. Um, important work happening. We appreciate it. And thanks for taking us through all the stages of the process that you've worked out to try to improve this situation. Hello, everybody. Fran Paleo Moyer, Badger Talks producer. We're talking to the Blue Green Algae Busters today in the Department of Engineering at UW. And they're giving us some really in cool information and who knew all these steps were involved. So a um, couple of questions for you all and everybody, please feel free to post some questions if you have them uh, in the chat on YouTube and on Facebook. So um, the, the size of this net uh, that you're saying is about a half of a meter. Is that what I saw there? And I'm wondering in terms of scale, is that what you're thinking would be the end product or would it be a much larger scale to capture more mass at a time? Why that scale, I guess, is the question. Why the half meter? Well, mm -hmm. I mean, in uh, our expectations here, we do, we do expect to use a half meter wide net in, in the real world. Um, for our prototyping though, we won't be, we don't have enough material to actually build prototypes of, of, of a half a meter wide by four meters long. Um, the issue here, though, is that, you know, the net, the, the river is big and it is long and uh, one net, as you could expect, won't be able to collect all the algae at once. So our goal here is to either continue to optimize the design of the net to be able to collect more algae uh, or decrease that force of drag uh, in a way that we can add more nets onto a, uh, a tow wing, kind of like what you saw in, in James's part. Um, but so we can cover more area in the river. Uh, we do have a consideration though that the river does have varying widths, varying depths, and it is a natural river. There will be uh, twigs and logs and other things that can tangle with nets too. So that is also a consideration when we're thinking about the size of our, of our nets. But as, as of now, yes, we are, we are expecting to move forward with a half meter by four meter long net. 
Okay, thank you. And not to take us too far off a of track, but I'm just curious, in, anywhere in your discussions, do you talk about alternative energy use or solar power use to power the boat to reduce overall budget? Is that something that's ever discussed in the team? Um, no, I don't think that we have um, discussed that discreetly. Um, we've so far been taking the fact of uh, trying to make the boat as fuel efficient as possible by trying to lower that drag force. Um, and then we do have the hopes that in future iterations, it would be automated in some capacity so as to move those multiple nets in a way that makes them as efficient as possible. Uh, based upon those varying widths, but I think um, with those electrical components, when we start thinking about um, automating any part of that net process or pumping some of that uh, material into a holding tank, that's where uh, there would be some great opportunities for some renewable energy sources to be integrated into that design. Super, thank you. Uh, so Alan Hills is asking, what happens to the collected blue-green algae? Um, so that was actually a part of the, um, the cost benefit analysis that was performed by the La Follette School of Public Affairs that um, we didn't get into in depth on our end. We were asked to focus on the, the harvesting end, um, but our clients at, in Brown County do have some ideas for how to repurpose um, that harvested algae, um, whether it be to turn it into physical products, um, such as you know, yoga mats or something along those lines, um, or to be able to harvest it to be able to be used in biofuels, um, things along those lines as well. But again, unfortunately, I don't think any of us have really gone into depth onto that end of things as we've been focused more on the mechanical process for harvesting it out of the river. That's very interesting, thank you. And Doris Dubilzig is also asking, how will the nets be emptied have you thought through that process? We, we've thought about it. Um, we've definitely considered that, that that's something that we really battled with, especially early on in the uh, decision-making process is uh, how frequently do the nets need to be cleaned and how would they be cleaned and emptied? Um, right now, the typical method of, of emptying these nets is really just washing um, into a larger storage container and then future drying. Um, but of course, that's not a very efficient way of uh, cleaning a lot of nets to get rid of a lot of blue-green algae. And so that, that would be a very interesting project to move into or, or to study later on. Um, but as, as of now, the, the go-to solution would just be to flip them inside out and wash them, just the conventional me method of, of cleaning out uh, blue-green algae or plankton nets. Thank you. Um, Abby Becker is asking, what was the most surprising result that the team members discovered throughout their research? Good question, Abby. On our end, the most surprising result is definitely how difficult it is to capture algae from a basis of just how small it is. When you think about even these plankton nets, they're taking on a scale of microns for the mesh sizing that needs to be used. It's very difficult. Well, how do you actually contribute to if it's clumping, clumping together due to surface tension and water falling together versus if you're doing on just an individual particle size? So it's definitely taking those considerations and working with that. That's been very surprising. Thank you. Uh, real quick, would, would each of the students mind going around and letting us know how you knew you wanted to study engineering? Did you have somebody that inspired you or what made you realize you wanted to become an engineering student? And that's for maybe some teachers we have out there watching and students. Sure, I'll start. Um, so the reason why I wanted to start engineering was uh, I have a couple uncles actually that were engineers. So they first were somewhat mentors, I guess, towards me. And then I've also been known to uh, I don't know the best way to put it. I, I take a lot of things apart, like uh, my brother's Xbox. I've been known to take those apart, to try to fix their controllers. Uh, I usually break them instead than fixing them, but I try my best. So I was told I should check out engineering. And then I'm also a huge Formula One fan. So if anyone knows about that, but so that's a huge part of engineering as well. Just the engineering piece that they do for how fast those cars can go. That, that got me hooked as well. 
Um, and I guess, so we don't have to shift cameras. Uh, <laughs> I'll go next. Uh, I think I've been involved with uh, mechanical things and processes for a long time myself. Um, I'm a long time bicycle mechanic and uh, my dad worked as a small engine mechanic when I was a kid. So I had a, a lot of um, access to mechanical um, devices and being able to work with different tools and, uh, and do things. And always been interested in the way that physics plays into uh, mechanical processes and uh, trying to better understand where forces will act on different devices. Um, so I think recognizing that a few years ago, my wife uh, suggested after seeing me disassembling and reassembling some things as well as uh, designing some things for use at home that uh, despite my uh, previous struggles with with some of the math when I was younger um, that I check out engineering as a uh, a way to put those two things my mechanical aptitude and fascination with physical processes together. Cool, thank you. Uh, I can I can pick up from there then. Um, the real answer is a whole line of things, um, but it can really go back to me and my dad working on a. Uh, a project when I was really young and funny enough it was just making a, a doorbell for my bedroom. Uh, we just wired up a button to a, a little speaker and it played a ding and I, from that point on I'm just like this is so cool. Uh, I got lucky enough growing up to have some really really great math calculus physics teachers going up uh, growing up and at high school they actually offered uh, basic engineering courses. They didn't do anything crazy, but it was a way to test the waters in engineering. And after the first one of those that I took, I, I knew that you know this is something that I want to pursue more, more seriously in college. Um, and I also know that those aren't offered everywhere. And I was pretty lucky to have that offered to me at my school. So uh, you know, if you're looking for recommendations, I, I'm definitely an advocate for uh, teaching engineering specific courses at, a, at not a college level school. But yeah, after that, I'm here. Here we are. You know, four and a half years later, we're, we're we're still loving it. Yeah, I can take it away next and on there. A little bit different. I started out as a kid. I was always just super fascinated with tinkering around, building things. Whether it started with Legos and then progressed to working on anything from boats to just figuring out what, how things worked in life. And I was just very interested in all these physical processes aspect building things. But I I had never thought I would initially be an engineer and denied it. I said I'm going to go be some business student and go create a business or something. And then I have engineers in my family and my parents said, hey, you should, why don't you just merge both or look into a little bit? And I said, sure, why not? When I was here in high school, deciding where I wanted to apply to university and what I wanted to do. And here I am four and a half years later as a mechanical engineering student. I have absolutely zero regrets and love the decision I made for it. Awesome. All right, I'll go. So. As a kid, I always loved doing puzzles, building Legos, similar to what John said. Um, and in school, math was always my favorite subject. And then in high school, I took an engineering class and we actually got to do some 3D printing, which I found really fascinating. And that's kind of what sparked my interest in engineering. Um, I've also always been interested in like the medical field. So um, this way I thought I could kind of combine my interest in like math and building things with the medical field and go into more like healthcare, mechanical engineering. Well, thanks for all of that. And thanks for inspiring younger students who may be tuning in today. Uh, really appreciate your work, Mike Cheadle and the Blue Green Algae Busters. Thanks so much for sharing uh, all of this important work with us today. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Great. So we're going to continue our focus on University Alliance work that's happening around the state and our next Badger Talks Live, which will be on Tuesday, November 16th at noon, we're going to be talking to Barb Durst, who's the Deputy Director of the Masters of Public Health Program, and she's going to be talking about evidence-based decision making that's being used to improve health outcomes in Adams County, Wisconsin, so please tune in. Please visit us at badgertalks.wisc.edu. You can also check out our new podcast there with Ben Rush, where we're going to be interviewing uh, a couple of different University Alliance speakers this month. See the upcoming schedule of live talks and sign up for our email list so you can be the first to know when new talks are scheduled. 
consider a donation to Badger Talks. We are supported by a grant. And also search the roster of over 400 UW faculty and staff that are on our website who have generously uh, offered to donate their time to come speak in communities like yours. Thanks so much for tuning in and we'll look forward to seeing you on the 16th. Thank you.